Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa. And today we are going to be talking about one of three different types of animals that you can raise in your backyard or small homestead for meat. We're going to be asking the question, why, how, and is it worth it? What's coming up next is rabbits. Is it worth it? Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead. Come along with us on our journey from a small suburban homestead lifestyle to our new lifestyle homesteading in the rural countryside of Southern Arizona. We'll share with you our tips, tricks, successes, and failures from both our past suburban lifestyle to our new rural lifestyle, all on the Two Acre Homestead. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. And I just want to say, raising rabbits can be really a rewarding and hard thing to do. This is just my personal opinion, but I think if you are new to homesteading and you've never raised an animal before, I highly recommend that you give rabbits a try over chickens. Yeah, that's right. Over chickens. We're going to discuss why I feel this way. Um, Even though myself personally, my first animal on our homestead was the chicken, of course. They are known to be the, some people anecdotally will say they are the gateway drug or gateway animal rather to homesteading. I challenge that thought process because rabbits are actually one of the easiest things to raise, especially if you have just a backyard. So let's get into it. So here in North America, um, the Northern Hemisphere, we'll put it that way, um, it just seems like we are so far removed from where our meat comes from. And you look out in the world today, and as of the recording of this podcast, we are experiencing inflation. And things are just getting really super expensive. And meat, specifically, is going through the roof. I happen to be fortunate that my husband and I, we raise predominantly most of our meat here on our homestead. Not all, but most of the meat that we consume is raised here. Rabbit is one of them. Rabbits are quiet. They don't require a lot of space. And even though they are cute, I strongly believe if you are the type of person who you know you are getting into homesteading This is the path that you're going to take. Raising a meat rabbit is probably the best over a chicken, the best thing that you can raise. And the reason I say that is because rabbits, and this is going to sound very strange, but because they're fur, they're a mammal, obviously, um, a mammal, but they're an animal with um, with fur on it. Totally different processing, totally different feeling of processing a meat rabbit or a rabbit as opposed to processing a chicken who has feathers. I think it's a little bit more it's it's a little bit more difficult at first to process something that's you know most people would say is cute and furry i've had so many people over the years say how in the world can you you know kill and process a rabbit well <laughs> easy 
Um, but it's, it's, that takes time. It takes grit. It takes, you have to develop that skill set of being able to process them on that day. It's a hard day. It's not a day that you're saying, yay, you know, I can't wait for these. No. Um, even with chickens, we raise chickens here on our homestead. And um, when it's processing day, it's never fun. Even even if it's a particular chicken, like, for example, just um, two months ago, we processed several chickens, um, almost 50 chickens here on our homestead. And one of them was our laying hen, um, one of our laying hens. We called her she was a bully. She was the thug of all of our, our, um, our hens. And, you know, I didn't like her. She was responsible for the death of one of the other chickens, which is why we called her. And, um, but it wasn't, I wasn't happy to get rid of her. I wasn't like, you know, yay. No, it's hard to get rid of any animal, but at the end of the day, you know that that particular animal, whether you like that animal or not, is going to provide you and your family with food. So one of the things I always, um, like a friend of mine, she just was here a couple of weeks ago and asked the same question. And I said, it starts from you harden yourself off the day they are either here on your property or the day they are born on your property. So for example, right now we have 15 kits. A kit is a baby rabbit. We have 15 right now on our property. And I see them every day. I do health checks on them every single day. But I do not allow myself to get emotionally attached to them like I do our breeding does and our breeding buck. Um, I just don't allow myself to get attached to them. Now, our buck and our does, um, our breeding does when, you know, after six years, because that's when they start slowing down in their production. So after six years, we won't use them anymore, but they will still be here on our property living a fantastic life because that is how we view them as more of a pet than something that we're going to, um, something that's going to provide our family with food. So you harden yourself off, just like you would a garden plant. You're taking it out of the greenhouse, um, and it's a seedling, and you set it outside for a couple, you know, for a couple hours, and then you bring it back in, and you keep doing that process over and over again. That's called hardening off. You do the same thing with your emotions. You harden off your emotions and you have to tell yourself this particular animal is, it has a purpose. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you looking to build a homestead from the ground up? Or maybe you're looking to build an off-grid dream home a vacation home, or maybe just a piece of land to call your own. Visit yourcheapland.com to buy rural land in the wide open spaces of Southwestern United States. When you visit yourcheapland.com, they're here to help you. And with their help, you can do this. You can take your dream of owning land and make it a reality. Most down payments are only $294, including the document fee. Remember, everyone qualifies for financing at yourcheapland.com. Head on over to yourcheapland.com and start making those dreams come true. And now, back to our podcast. It's not a pet. It's this animal serves a purpose. So you'll hear some people say, don't name them. Don't, don't pet them. Um, 
some people might say, go ahead and name them. Um, go ahead and pet them. And I actually agree with that. Go ahead and pet them, handle them. But know in the back of your mind, I am not letting myself get attached because that animal serves a purpose on your homestead. Here in North America, we've lost that edge. So by raising a meat rabbit, Raising rabbits like this, it will help you develop that edge because if you're going into homesteading and homes, you know, you're going to be raising larger animals, you're going to need to have that same amount of grit. You're going to need to have that same amount of hardening off. We've lost that edge here because of, you know, all of our meat comes shrink wrapped in the grocery store. So there's no connection. But once you start knowing where that meat has come from and you have that connection with that meat, that meat is precious to you. I know that is how I feel when we have any meat on our homestead and you know, we serve it at dinner or we serve it during lunch, but mostly at dinner. That's the only time that we really will eat a lot of meat um, is at dinner. During the day, it's usually just vegetables, fruit, legume, rice, that type of thing. But, um, you know, in the evening, you know, if the kids aren't eating any of the meat, you know, we, I, I don't force them to eat what they don't want to eat, but... In my mind, I'm saying an animal died. You need to consume that. This meat is precious. We need to show it respect. And at the end of the day, you, when you just throw meat away, you're disrespecting the life of the animal that died. So when you raise your own meat, that meat becomes precious you respect you it's almost like it's built in like you just automatically respect the life of the animal that died so that you and your family can eat so it becomes a precious commodity and then you kind of start looking at things in the grocery store like you know you start looking at the meat that's in the grocery store and you're thinking huh you know, no wonder why we kind of have this throwaway society because we have no connection with the animal that was associated with those pork chops, with the animal that was associated with that chicken breast. There's no connection. And then there are animals that we used to eat that, you know, your great grandparents, my great grandparents, and generations, thousands of generations have eaten that we don't eat anymore, that are really super good and healthy for you. One of those animals that we've lost a taste for is rabbit. Rabbit is an excellent meat. It's high in iron. It's one of the highest in iron it's one of the um oh, what what's the word i'm looking for it it has practically no fat um it is leaner than chicken breast that's how little fat it is so if you're somebody who is concerned about their weight if you're somebody who is trying to maybe you have a cholesterol issue and you're trying to you know, you still want to consume meat and you want to lower your cholesterol. Rabbit is actually, actually your meat of choice um, because it has such low cholesterol. I mean, it, it's just perfect. So let's get into how you would raise your rabbit. There are several books that are out there. Um, you can go on Amazon and you can look at all different types of books. 
um, that will tell you how to raise rabbits for meat. I know one book that um, I actually had to dig this out of our library. I haven't had to refer to this too much anymore, but this book got me well on my way and it's called Raising Raising Rabbits for Meat and it's by Eric Rapp and Colleen Rapp. Eric and Colleen Rapp. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Her name is spelled C-A-L-L-E-N-E and then Rapp, R-A-P-P. Um, it's a small book. It's, it's, I mean, you could read this in a day or at least I did, but you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of a book person. So you could read this in a day, maybe a couple days and really be able to wrap your head around some of the things that we're going to discuss today. So the first thing when it comes to raising rabbits is you want, you want to know the why you're raising rabbits. Why are you raising them for meat? Are you raising them because they're cute and cuddly and you want a pet for your kids? Are you raising them for pelts? That's right. Pelts, the skin, um, because uh, you can not the skin, excuse me, the fur, because you can actually raise rabbits and use their fur. So some rabbits are dual purpose. And so there's different breeds for different things. Now, for the purpose of this podcast, obviously, we are talking about meat rabbits. So we are not going to discuss anything that's cute and cuddly for a pet. Now that we've set that aside, now we want to look at, are you raising them for meat or meat and pelts? So some of the breeds that I think are pretty interesting are the American rabbits. And actually, if you can get your hands on an American rabbit, they're usually white um, and then they've got like black splotches, sometimes usually a patch over one eye and maybe some dark uh, black ears. I would say get my hands on an American rabbit. They are starting to become endangered and I would definitely, definitely, definitely breed them. Um, I know myself personally, if I could get my hands on one of them or two or three, I would breed them with no problem. Um, another one. So ones that are dual purpose that serve the purpose of meat and fur is, um, an American chinchilla. The American chinchilla is, um, starting to get, get a little bit more popular. They're a bigger breed. Um, they're really good meat, meat rabbit. They are also, um, they are also starting to become endangered as well. So again, um, or they're not starting, they've been endangered, but they are starting to become a little bit more popular. People are really looking for them. Um, so they're good for their pelt and, um, the, the meat. Cinnamons are also, um, they are, <laughs> Those rabbits, I've seen them in person. They are so adorable. Um, and they are a pretty big, they're adorable and they're big. Um, cinnamons, they can weigh anywhere between nine, nine to 10 pounds. Um, and when I say nine to 10 pounds, that means, um, I, I mean, hanging weight. Their hanging weight is nine to 10 pounds. Hanging weight meaning that's what they weigh after you have processed them. So they're, they're a big rabbit. Um, and uh, they have an interesting story. You can look it up online, the cinnamon rabbit. They actually were bred accidentally. So one of my favorite that I wish I could um, raise here on our homestead is the Californian. Now, the Californian is um they are they've been crossbred with a lot of other breeds um and they have a hanging weight of about eight pounds to ten pounds as well um but something about the Californian um that you all need to be aware of is that they do not if you're in a hot climate like I am 
they don't do well in the heat. Let me repeat that. They do not do well in heat. I can say that from personal experience. I had a Californian and unfortunately she died. And what we were able to figure out is she died from the heat. Um, so yeah, do not raise them if, uh, if you're in a very hot climate. But I will say from personal experience, they are really good moms. Um, them and another breed, I'm sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent now, but they are really good does. Really, really good does. Absolutely love them. Now, on the flip side, a rabbit that is good for the hot climate is the Champagne d'Argent. Okay, I speak French. I'm going to try to say this without the French accent, but um, Champagne <laughs> I've practiced this, but I guess I just don't know how to say Argent without Frenchifying it. So I'll spell it. Um, it's Champagne and then the D is separate. And then A-R-G-E-N-T, Champagne d'Argent. And um, these particular rabbits are very good in hot climates. They can tolerate the heat um, and they are really, really good uh, for their meat. The Flemish Giant is also a, a good breed. They are huge. <laughs> and um, live weight, that means when they are alive, not their hanging weight, but live weight, they can get about 20 pounds um, so that's a really big, that, that's the size of a dog, um, of a small dog. So that's a really good size. Um, and let's see here. And the Flemish giant, they are not good with heat. So you're going to notice a pattern here when it comes to meat rabbits. The smaller the meat rabbit is, the better they do with heat. The larger the meat rabbit is, they don't do so well in the heat. Rabbits, generally speaking, like cold climate. Um, most rabbits do. So, yeah, you'll you'll find this to be pretty much in, I, I guess, you know, a theme here. Um, French Angora. The Angora rabbit is a dual purpose rabbit. It is a meat rabbit and also good for its pelt. The New Zealand, I personally have New Zealand blends, um, and we'll get into that at the very end here, but um, I do have New Zealands here on our homestead, and I can tell you that they, from personal experience, they are, oh my gosh, they are really good moms, really good does. They produce a large amount of kits. By the way, Side note, the Californians also produce large litters, large amounts of kits. Um, so we're talking like our Californian one time, she produced 12 kits. No joke. I don't even know how she humanly did that. Now, they did not. She's not human, by the way. But <laughs> um, I don't know. They, they did not all survive, but she did produce. Produce twelve. So um, they, them Californians and New Zealand's large litters. So um, if you're looking for high production, like numerically a lot of rabbits, those are your rabbits. Um, but again, the New Zealand live weight you're looking at about nine to twelve pounds. So that's a considerably smaller rabbit. And that's why they do good in the heat. Now, a side note, footnote here with the New Zealands. And again, I am speaking from my own personal experience as well. And I think you'll find most people who breed New Zealands will tell you the same thing. They are little hotheads. 
They are not the cute and cuddly, you can handle them, let your kids feed them. No, they are pretty feisty. They're a little bit aggressive. And um, actually, they're they're a lot of bit aggressive, um, especially the does and especially when the does are pregnant and about to um, about to give birth. Yeah, they can be pretty, pretty mean. So um, but like I said, whew, they are good moms and they produce really well. Then there is the Rex. And the Rex is also a dual purpose uh, rabbit, also raised for fur and um, for meat. And they weigh about eight pounds to nine pounds live weight. So another one, our, our, um, our rabbits are mixed with this, and that is called the silver fox. Um, so a silver fox is, they are absolutely beautiful. Their fur is, it, it, it's just the softest fur. It's soft and silky and, um, it has a dark sepia color to it. And, um, so sometimes in certain light, it can look one color and the other light, it can look another color. Um, but they should not be exposed. If you have a pure silver fox, don't try to raise them in either the extreme heat or the extreme cold. They're like the rest of us. They like perfect temperatures. So, um, but those are just some things to think about when you are, those are the different types of breeds that you can think about when you are trying to figure out what type of rabbit you want to raise. Now, I want to get into this because I know a lot of rabbit breeders are probably not going to agree with me on this, but that's okay. I think there's enough room and enough voices in the homesteading space that we can have different opinions. There is something called meat mutts. When you get into raising rabbits, you're going to hear that term. Oh, that's a meat mutt. That's what I have. What is a meat mutt? A meat mutt means it's a rabbit that's not pure. So like I said, I have New Zealands and my New Zealands are mixed with silver fox and a little bit of Californian. Um, so they're not pure. Now, I did that intentionally. And the reason why I did that is the um, breeder that I chose to go with, she is here in this part of the state that I live in. And so her climate actually is a little bit hotter than mine. And um, I chose to go with that particular mixture because that's good for the heat and it's good for the cold (laughs) because where I am here in Southern Arizona, I have very extreme temperatures. It can be, the ground can be frozen solid and highs maybe in the thirties during the winter, um, lows in the twenties, even maybe the teens. And then in the summertime, we can get up to a hundred degrees. So I have very extreme temperatures. So I need rabbits that can handle that. And that's what she focuses on breeding is rabbits that can handle specifically the heat. Um, And so we made the choice to go with that particular breeder. Most people will say to you, do not go with meat mutts because you're not going to get as big of um or as much meat and it's going to take longer for the rabbit to grow. So there's the feed conversion ratio that you have to factor in. And basically you have to look at the math. How much feed are you giving that rabbit and how long is it going to take for that rabbit to grow out to butcher weight? We'll get to the butchering weight 
at the very, very end of this podcast. But you have to figure that out for yourself. Now, this particular breeder that I went with, she's already done the math for us and specifically with with these specific rabbits that we have. So we know what our grow out rate is, like how long it'll take to grow out our rabbits and um, how much food it takes for us to feed them. Fortunately for us, and I hope that this is the case for you guys, rabbits eat, they have a very broad diet. There's a lot of things that they can eat. And again, we'll get into that a little bit further, but um, we don't feed them just pellets. We feed them a lot of things. And so that really helps with our feed conversion rate. So I encourage you to do some homework, do your own homework, look it up, find out what that rate, that conversion rate is for you um, and for the type of breed. I can't tell you what it is because it depends on what breed you go with. Each breed is different. And so that's why it's important for you to know what type of rabbit you want to have and the why. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, but anyway, we will go on here. We're, next subject is caring for your rabbits, how to care for them. So when you're caring for your rabbits, one of the things that you want to think about is climate. Remember that rabbits basically are wearing a coat. So in the heat, they're wearing a coat. Step outside in your wool coat and see how long you last in the middle of July. And then you'll know what your rabbits are facing. Remember, when rabbits are hot, they don't sweat like we do. So they expel their heat through their ears. So you really want to pay attention to their ears. Are their ears bright red and they're really panting? Are they laying on their side panting and their ears are bright red? You know that rabbit's in trouble with heat. One of the things we do here on our homestead when it comes to heat, first of all, we have our rabbits right now in cages. And what we do is we find that it's better to have them in cages in the summer because all we need to do is we take we go to the dollar store and we buy those cheapy aluminum um oh, they're not aluminum but anyway those cheapy baking things that you can you know like a baking sheet and we freeze we put water in it and we freeze it and then in the afternoon we can take that, uh, that pan and put it up under the cage. So that way the rabbits are sitting on top of the ice and they're getting themselves cool. Another thing that you can do to keep your rabbits cool in the summer is by simply just having a simple fan and just keeping a fan blowing on them. We don't do that here in our homestead because our rabbits share um, space right now during the summer with the chickens. So we have our rabbit cages on an elevated part of our chicken yard and um, and uh, it's covered and it's cooler because our chicken yard sits up under some pretty large trees that we have on our, on our property. So the rabbits can stay away from predators that are really abundant here on our homestead right now during the summer and they stay cool and they get the extra cool from having those baking sheets that are iced over. Um, and they're just sitting there in nice cold ice. Literally I have seen my rabbits go from panting heavy to we stick the ice trays up under them and literally you see them stop panting because they're getting nice and cooled down. And we usually do that anywhere between the two to four o'clock time during the day because that's the hottest time of the day. 
Now, when it comes to keeping rabbits warm, again, remember they're wearing a coat. So again, wool coat outside in the middle of winter, wherever it is that you are. Um, you know, if you're like us and you get ice and we don't necessarily get snow, but it is bitterly cold here. Um, and so you need to protect them from the from the cold elements. So do they have a place where they can burrow down? Um, are they inside a building? Give them extra hay, give them heating mats. Um, I know some people even use heat lamps, the same type of heat lamp that you would use for baby chicks. That red, uh, that red lamp, there's, there's other there's other lamps as well that don't have the red or there's heat blocks. If you've got power to your barn or wherever you're keeping your rabbits, put that out for them. And that way they stay nice and warm. So that's one thing that you want to do as far as caring for your meat rabbits. The other thing is housing. So this can be a little bit controversial and yeah, housing can be housing can be really controversial for some people. Now, I have had people actually direct message me on Instagram and ask me questions about colony raising rabbits. I am very pro colony raising my rabbits. And there are so many pros and cons to either one. Even though right now my rabbits are in cages, um I am still very pro colony raising our rabbits. Let's get into why we kind of do both. First off, if you're new to this, colony raising is basically putting your rabbits in an enclosed environment that mimics what their natural environment would be. So, for example, we have, my husband built this I want to say it's a building, but it's almost like a little lean-to, um, but it stands alone by itself. And um, what we did, it it has obviously the four corners, so it's square. And we put wire mesh top to bottom, and the floor is all wired, and it's all connected. Basically, we made one gigantic cage. That's basically what we did. And I believe the size of ours is, um, I think it's 10 feet by 20 feet. If, uh, if I'm thinking of it correctly. Um, but it's, it's pretty large. And what we did is, um, we allowed the, the rabbits to be in that area and we put what's called buckets. Um, so bucket burls. And basically we took buckets, dug them into the ground, had holes bored out of those buckets on the side and had tubes connected to each bucket. And the beauty of that is, is that in the winter and even when the weather starts to get a little bit warmer, they can go into those bucket burrows and that's, they like to live in those burrows. And they all live together. I have never had a problem with my buck and my does living together, um, except for when it's time to give birth. So you really just kind of have to watch them. They they will fight for a little bit. But um, and like I said, I mean, I have New Zealand. Whew, she's. That particular doe is more New Zealand than anything else. And she is mean when she's about to give birth. But the other, we, the space is so big that the other rabbit can kind of get away. The other female rabbit can kind of get away and she can jump up and, you know, not be bothered by um, the other, the other rabbit. So that is what a colony looks like. Sounds like. <laughs> Then, of course, there's cages. So I'm going to go through, I have a list of um, some of the pros and the cons of both. So 
If you're going to raise rabbits in cages, just know you can easily keep them clean because usually they're either pooping in the tray or if you're like us, we have it to where their poop just falls, their, their, their poop just falls down to the floor. They're not in contact with their urine or poop at all. You can keep them cool easier when they're in cages. And you can avoid them fighting when they're in cages. Some of the cons to having your rabbits in cages is that they lose, actually, they lose their muscle tone because they're not able to move around so much. So they lose some of that muscle tone. And, you know, the other thing is, is that they lose their social habits They start to become a little bit more moody when they're in the cages. Um, They're more likely to bite you because they feel so isolated. Um, And setting up the cages can be very expensive. I haven't had to buy cages in a little bit, but the last time I bought a 30 by 30 size cage, which by the way, 30 feet by 30... (laughs) Is it 30 feet or is it 30 inches? 30 by 30 cage is what you want in the size. uh, You want your cages to be that size. That's enough room for the rabbits to move around, um, have some liberty of moving around. And even if you have a, a doe that gives birth in those cages, that's still enough room. Um, and believe me, I've got, five kits right now in one cage. Actually, yeah, each cage has five kits right now and they are perfectly fine. Um, yeah, so, but they are expensive. <laughs> They're expensive. And the last time I had to buy one, I want to say it was like $45 to buy one cage. So they're expensive. Um, It's expensive to set it up. Now, that being said, you can build your own cages. Um, I have never done that myself personally, so I cannot speak to that experience. I know there's a lot of YouTube videos out there. I would say check out, I I can't think of the guy's name, but it's the Rabbitry. I don't know. Look up on YouTube. It's called the Rabbitry. It's it's a guy out in... um, in Michigan. And he has a really good video on building rabbit cages. Um, and he has a, he has actually a pretty good YouTube channel when it comes to raising and breeding rabbits. And he also has an interesting, um, he kind of has a little bit of a hybrid setup there for colony raising, um, his cages and colony I'm not interested in doing it that way, but um, you may find it interesting. So I would encourage you to go check him out. And I am, I don't even know if he's a listener to the podcast. I'm not paid by him or anything like that, but it's just some, some, a channel that I find he has some interesting things. Now, as far as colony raising your rabbits, um, I do want to, to put this one thing out here. When you're raising your rabbits on a, in a colony situation, you want to make sure that you either have only one buck or keep your bucks separated. Keep them out um, where they're not together. Two bucks together is never a good, it's just not going to, it's just not going to work. There's just way too much testosterone. Not going to work. So only one buck in the colony. Um Yeah, trust me, one buck. You don't want more than that. So colony, the pros of raising a colony is that they, especially if you do the bucket burrow system, they can dig and they can, um, they can burrow safely and, um, they can regulate their body temperature, whether it's cool or hot, a little bit easier, they keep that muscle tone because they're moving around a lot more. Um, and 
it's not as expensive as setting up all of the cages. And some people will use a shed. So if you've already got a shed and it's not being used, use it to raise your rabbits. Um, so that's making use of something that you already have. And rabbits, when they're raised in a colony, you will be amazed at how happier they are and how much more social they are. Um, they clump up together. They sleep together. They they fight, but they, they still sleep together and they, they clump up together. They're around each other. Rabbits are social animals and um, they really like to be together in that colony situation. But raising rabbits in a colony has its cons. And here's a couple of my cons. When you have a colony, um, you can get more viruses, more disease. It's harder to clean out the cage, or the, the colony area. Um, and also you open yourself up to more predator attack. Um, and you don't have the control over who breeds with whom. So it's just kind of a free for all. And believe you me, rabbits can, I, there's a technical word for it, but rabbits can hold on to the semen, um, the, the females, they can hold on to that semen and they may not show their pregnancy until like way past the time that they've been bred. And then all of a sudden you have a surprise litter. So I, I know we just had that happen where um, one of our females, one of our does, she just, I mean, she's been in the cage for a month and a half. She hasn't been with our buck in a month and a half. And she just gave birth. As of the recording of this, she just gave birth yesterday, much to our surprise. We were like, whoa, we didn't even know she was pregnant. Um, but that's that's the problem with colony raising is that you don't have control. So if you really want to have control over how much meat, how how much time you're spending processing, um, how much meat you're producing and how much time you're spending uh, producing such meat, then you might want to keep them in a cage. Um, I would try to encourage you to make sure that if you do cages, keep them meshed together, the cages. So that way they can at least see each other and be next to each other physically. Um, I know that's how we do it. And it seems like our rabbits are a little bit happier. Now, um, if you're in an area like us, I do want to add this cautionary thing. When you are building a rabbit colony, do not use chicken wire. Stay away from it. It's not good. Predators can get into your rabbit colony. We had that happen and one of our does died because a snake got in there and killed her. The snake was after her babies. We believe that she was protecting her her babies. Um, everybody was accounted for. But yeah, it was a bad situation. So that is my personal experience. And that's why we keep our our rabbits right now in cages because of the snake uh, problem. And then we have a lot of, here in our area, we have a lot of rattlesnakes. Um, we have king snakes and um, other types of snakes. And... Um, yeah, so you have to really, really be careful of that. Uh, then when snake season is done, which is, I think that's in September, October, they'll start going, they'll start burrowing in and they go away. Then that's when we will put them back into their colony and they can do their thing in their colony. Um, right now we have turkeys in their colony um, because the turkeys will kill any snake. So there's no threat to them. But um, that is our personal story with why we do both. But our preference is to raise them in a colony. So now feeding your rabbits, um, there, are, there are pros and cons to feeding them pellets 
um, I have read that you really want to feed the adult rabbits, especially if you are breeding them for meat. Try your best to stick with pellets. That is what I've read. <laughs> that's not necessarily what I do, but that's what I've read. And um, on our homestead, we do both. So we feed them a little bit of pellet, but because we we do a lot of gardening, um, they get a lot of garden fresh food, stuff that we're not consuming for um but you know, there are some things that you you don't want to feed them, for example, like carrots. I know carrots are synonymous with rabbits, but you don't want to feed them carrots because it'll make them too fat. The carrot tops have too much calcium in them. So generally speaking, don't fear don't feed your rabbits carrots. Don't feed them a lot of brassicas. Um and brassicas are like uh, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, kales, those things. Don't feed them a lot of that because it can make them sick and it can produce a lot of gas in their stomach. And believe it or not, rabbits don't fart. So they, you know, that gas will build up. It's called bloat and um, it can kill them. So just be careful. Um, but there are safe foods for them to eat. Uh, if you want to just like feed them produce, feed them naturally. Um, there are things like uh, cucumbers. They can eat grapes. They can eat most fruits. Um, I don't know of too many fruits that they can't eat. But again, you need to do your research on this and find out what they can eat. But um, I know we feed ours like celery, Swiss chard, purslane, um, spinach, uh, artichoke leaves, um, trying to think <laughs> there's, there's a host of things that we feed them. Bok choy, sunflower, sunflower seeds are very good for the does, especially when they're, um, when they're about to, uh, when they're about to have babies, give them, uh, give them sunflower seeds and, um, oats. Oats are really good for them. Um, yeah, so do your research, look up, uh, the list is exhaustive. There, There's an exhaustive list on what they can eat and what they can't eat. Um, the other thing that they can eat that they absolutely love and the pellets that you buy from the feed store, they're usually made from this and that is alfalfa. So we actually have bales of alfalfa hay and we feed that to them um they make their nest with the alfalfa hay they eat it they love it i highly recommend giving them um giving them alfalfa but i will caution you especially for raising meat rabbits don't overfeed them with the pellets and don't 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 overfeed them um, because they they can get fat and it uh, it'll prevent them from being able to have their kits. So you really want to be careful of that. And stay away from things like uh, delphinium lupine, lupine rather, um, poppies, rhubarb leaves, uh, nightshade family, uh, nightshade, like tomatoes, eggplant, the leaves of those things stay far away from those things. They're deadly. Hemlock, uh, oak leaves, potato tops, um, yeah, those those type of things you do not want to feed your rabbits. You will you will kill them. It's very toxic to them. So now we're coming to butchering time. This is the hard time when you've done all of your hard work and it's time to say goodbye. Generally speaking, it takes about 15 
weeks to grow out your rabbits. And what's your goal in all of this work that you've been doing to raise them is this. You're looking for the hanging weight of your rabbits to be about five to six pounds. Five to six pounds is about the same size as a chicken. Now here's the catch. I'm not going to get into how to process rabbits in this podcast. Um, there's a lot of videos out there. Um, there's a lot of books. I encourage you to do your homework. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, go back. There's a post that I did. I can't tell you when, but there's a book that I show and it's about butchering and how to butcher. I highly recommend using that book to find out how to butcher your rabbits humanely. Um, but once you have butchered them and once that meat has sat for at least 24 hours and chilled, and I don't mean like chill, like hang out chill. I mean like chilled temperature wise. So you want to put the meat in a cooler for 24 hours sitting in ice, ice water for 24 hours. The next day, you need to know what you're going to do with that meat. So the best thing to do, the most recommended thing to do with rabbit meat is to simply can it. Um, and that's because rabbit meat, because it's so thin or so lean, excuse me, um, it doesn't have a whole lot of fat. So it is really soft when you can it. Canning and processing your meat that way requires a pressure canner. And if you're not familiar with pressure canning, I encourage you to get yourself familiar with pressure canning. This is another reason why I think raising rabbits is good for those of you who want to start this journey of homesteading because it kind of puts you in that position of learning how to can, how to preserve that meat for the long haul. And that way, later down the road, you'll learn, you'll already know how to can. And um, the best resource that I can recommend to you for learning how to can how to pressure can. We're not talking water bath canning. Pressure canning is the National Center for um, Home Food Preservation website. There's also the Ball Canning book. Um, you want to check that out. That's You can find that on Amazon. That will tell you a step-by-step -step guide. Now, when it comes to canning, I will say this. Um, there are some YouTube channels out there that are really good that will really teach you how to can properly. I know when I first started on my journey, again, this person has no idea who I am. Um, and again, I've been doing this. I've been canning since 2014 and I don't even know if her channel is still around, but, um, Oh man, her last name just went out of my head. Linda's, no, it's her YouTube channel is called Linda's Pantry. I don't know if her channel is still around, but I, when I first started in 2014, I read books, websites, National Center for Home Food Preservation, and I watched her can. I would highly recommend if you're looking for somebody to watch on YouTube who can teach you how to can, if her channel is still up, I would say her channel is probably, in my opinion, the best. Um, there's some other channels out there and the, the canning world, <laughs> I've heard some people call it the canning trolls, but um, I think that's kind of harsh, but there are very, very strong opinions in the canning world. And um, like you have to can this way and you have to can that way. As you grow as a homesteader, you will find what you are most comfortable with. 
But um, those are the website, book, and YouTube channel that I would recommend to get you started, at least getting you started on the right way. And if you choose to do what's called rebel canning down the road, you can. That's on you. That's between you and your family. Um, but those channels will really help you. Um, and yeah, when you're trying to process getting back to rabbits, I, I'm sorry, I went down a rabbit hole, but, um, pun intended by the way, but, um, yeah, when you're processing your rabbits, the best way to, to, to save that meat is to can it. You can obviously freeze it as well. Um, but I would say canning it is probably the best. The other thing I would recommend, um, when you're canning is can, do not try to debone your rabbits. Um, that's a fool's errand. <laughs> There's so many bones. Um, they have so many little bones. And um, I would say if you can it, when you take it out of the can to, to eat the meat, the bones just come right out. So that would be my recommendation is to just simply can it. Well... This was a long episode. <laughs> I hope that this answered any of your questions. Um, and I hope this like kind of helps you to think about rabbits. There are a lot of pros. Uh, there's way more pros to keeping rabbits than there are cons. So if you have any other questions on keeping rabbits, go ahead. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and that is Lisa at the two acre homestead dot com. Or you can direct message me on Instagram with the same handle, the two acre homestead. Well, that is it for me on this hot first day of July. <laughs> I hope you and your family are doing well from my family to your family. Happy homesteading and stay safe out there. <laughs>